this session about the last girl first, which is the, the, the bulk of this uh, Congress. First of all, I have to uh, uh, share that, unfortunately, Diane Matt, who is the uh, Secretary General of uh, CAP International, with the coordinator of a great NGO, LACLE, uh, CLES, in uh, Canada, was supposed to moderate this uh, session, but for health reasons, she, she could not come. But uh, I think we have a, a thought for, for her. I think we can applaud Diane also. And thus, I will moderate myself the, the session and do my best. Um, yes. So the aim of this session was to highlight something which is uh, very important to us, and which is that all over the world and throughout history, the most disadvantaged groups have always been overrepresented in prostitution. It is true in Canada with the overrepresentation of indigenous women. Uh, in prostitution, but only in Canada. This is true in India with the overrepresentation of Adivasi women in prostitution, the overrepresentation of Dalit women, the uh, overrepresentation of low caste and so called uh, DNT, uh, denotified uh, tribes. This is true in Europe with the overrepresentation of refugees, of migrant women, and it's true actually all over the world. And thus, what we wanted to propose today is to invite direct representatives of those very discriminated groups, but also very strategic groups and leaders from those groups to explain by themselves how they understand uh, the situation. So this panel uh, will comprise both survivors of sexual exploitation, survivors of prostitution, but also indigenous leaders, Dalit leaders, or leaders of uh, uh, discriminated groups. So we will start, I will just introduce the, the speakers. Um, so we will give the floor first to uh, Jacqueline, uh, who is the co-founder of Indigenous Women Against Sex Industry in Canada. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah? I have to tell my heart to stop beating so quickly. Every time I speak publicly, it just pounds like a drum. And you don't know how much I've practiced this at home to make sure that I'm within my 10 minute time limit, but damn, I can only get it down to 11, so please excuse whatever overage I have. I'd like to start out by saying to the women and girls in India, and especially to those that have been prostituted or are being prostituted, Myself as an ind indigenous woman, my heart goes out to you. I thought about it, you know, I, I realized that we share a common past of being colonized. And because of this, we know that we have wounds and we have scars that tell us that we don't belong, that we aren't good enough, and that we, we don't deserve. And these are the wounds of colonization. But I know that we are joined as sisters in this global fight. And it's a good fight. And I want to thank um, APNIAP and CAP International for their generous and kind support for me to be here today. It's a privilege. I want to say, you know, I'm lucky, I feel lucky to be alive and breathing. And I shouldn't have to feel lucky about that. But the truth is, I do, because many of my sisters in Canada are not. When I was growing up, and pardon me, but I have to refer to my notes. If not, I'll wander off, and you'll wander off with me, and we'll all be wandering. <laughs> but anyway, when I was growing up, my greatest fear was that I would be taken from my home. As crazy as my family was, as toxic as they were, they were still my family, and I still belonged to them. Mm? And later on in life, I realized that um, my fear, my childhood fear, was deeply rooted in the past of my people. What I learned was that for over 100 years, we were taken from our homes and we were seized and we were placed in residential schools. These schools were state sanctioned. And the sole purpose of these schools was to civilize the savages, to the, these little savages. 
in, in essence, to kill the Indian in us. The last school closed in 1996. That's not that far, that's not that long ago, right? 150,000 of our children were taken from us. 60,000 of us died in these schools. These schools had children's graveyards attached to them. I don't know any school in Canada that has graveyards on their school grounds. What they, what they stood as were testaments, tragic testaments, to the school's lethal intent for us. Either they killed us in the school or they killed us as survivors trying to get through life, right? Our hearts broke when our children were taken from us. The family was torn apart. The fabric of our culture was torn apart. Our hearts are still breaking because our children are still being taken from us. What happened um, at the onset of the seizure of our children was alcohol was introduced. And it was introduced, to, and we took it as a way to cope with the losses. Too painful. Too painful to bear. And today, alcohol, introduced by Europeans, is still wreaking havoc on our culture, from cradle to grave. We have babies born, not full mast, as a result of alcohol. There's a community center in the downtown east side. If you're indigenous, you're considered an elder when you're 40 years of age. What does that tell you? So what stands today in the place of residential schools? is the racist child welfare system. Only 4% of Canada's youth and children are indigenous, yet our children comprise almost 50% of the foster care system. Today, our children in care are lost, not only to themselves, but to us, their family, and to community. Foster care is a cruel, institutional reminder that they do not belong anywhere anymore. You know, when, when they get, when they are come of age and they are released, there is no smooth transition for them. They are just booted out of care and they are left to navigate on their own that vulnerable transition into adulthood. Last November, a 19-year-old girl, not very far away from where I lived, was found dead in a pop-up tent. She was only six months out of care. The best the state could offer her for housing was a pop-up tent. The best the state, yes. And her, her death is not an isolated incident. A newspaper article reads, our children are not aging out of care now. They are dying out of care. Indigenous women, many of us fostered as children, are also, as you know, are also overrepresented in prostitution. Prostitution was never our way. I don't believe that prostitution, that Indigenous women then, or Indigenous women now, want to be fucked by strangers, no matter how much money passes through hands. Prostitution came over with the white man. Brothels were built around every military fort, every trading post, and indigenous women were ceased and forced into what I consider rape chambers. In the words of one survivor, prostitution, we do not choose prostitution. Prostitution chooses us. And those of us who have been prostituted, we face lifetimes of physical and sexual male violence. And the great majority of us have had multiple abusers growing up. We flee from our homes and our communities to escape this male violence, plus the violence of poverty. And we end up in cities where we are predated upon by pimps. We are physically assaulted and raped in prostitution continuously in overwhelming numbers. We are hunted down. Canada is our killing fields, and I really need a glass of water. Excuse me. Thank you. Canada is, is our killing fields. 
And I believe that it's been that way for 600 years. Her name was Cindy Gladu. She was a prostituted woman living in Edmonton, Alberta. She was stabbed in her vagina by a violent trick named Bradley Barton. Did Barton call an ambulance out of concern for Cindy Gladue? As she made her way bleeding to the bathroom, Barton fell asleep. He callously disregarded her. To him, Cindy was just a squaw, a whore. To him, she was not fully human. The next morning, he went to work. Barton carried on with his daily activities as Cindy lay bleeding out in a bathtub. Hours later, he returned to the motel to find her dead. He was charged with murder, and his defense said that he and Cindy had engaged in some rough sex. Yeah, gets worse. Cindy's vagina was cut out of her, preserved and presented as court evidence. With her family present, the most private part of her body was blown up and put on display for jurists' scrutiny. And I might add that all the jurors were non-Indigenous. It wasn't horrendous enough that she was humiliated and dehumanized in prostitution, but the courts went even further by defiling and degrading her even in her death. Barton was found not guilty, appeals now underway. If the case is reopened, in all likelihood, Barton will receive a slight slap on the wrist. There will be no justice for Cindy Gladue or her family. The state's message is loud and clear and 600 years old. Indigenous women are not worthy of or entitled to justice, and this is nothing short of state violence. In the remote northern town of Val d'Or, Quebec, 12 courageous women spoke out against eight police officers who had physically and sexually assaulted them for years. Altogether, 37 complaints were filed. Predictably, because the police investigated their own, not a single charge was laid. In the words of one woman, we feel betrayed, humiliated, and our hearts are broken into a thousand pieces. It's as though in the eyes of this country's justice system, we're not important. We don't count, and we weren't listened to. It's like fear will never cease to haunt us. The officers have returned to their regular work. As a, result of the women, as a result, the women's fear of retaliation is palpable. Police assaults against indigenous women in this small northern mining town will worsen. And this is a tactic that is used the world over by bullies and batterers they'll make sure that not one Indigenous woman ever speaks up again in that town. For decades, Indigenous women in Canada have called for a national inquiry into the 1,200 Indigenous women who've gone missing or been murdered. I'd like to just say, for the record, we're not missing. Okay, we've never been missing. We've been <laughs> stolen. We've been taken. We're probably dead. We're not missing. I don't know why we say this. Maybe it's to cushion the pain of the lethality of it. I just have to say that I'm sorry. I just get carried away sometimes. We're, we're not missing. We're stolen. Please use that word. Please. That's the truth. <clears throat> 1,200 is not an accurate figure either. Okay, here's why. Because oftentimes our women's murders are documented as suicides, accidents, overdoses, or they're not even documented. In Canada, Indigenous women are four times more likely to be murdered than non-Indigenous women. 
So after pressure from feminists internationally and nationally, our Prime Minister called for the long-awaited National Inquiry. He recommended that Indigenous feminists lead it. Were our recommendations met? No. In fact, during the pre-inquiry consultations, Indigenous feminist analyses were not sought. A lot is being ignored by the National Inquiry. Systemic state violence is not being investigated, neither is the sexual violence, which is prostitution. The National Inquiry says it wants to get to the root of, a, of the violence committed against us, yet these glaring omissions prove otherwise. What would it mean if Indigenous women and girls' lives truly mattered? What if the full complement of our human rights were restored to us? First and foremost, I believe the sexist and racist elements still contained with the eight, within the 1876 Indian Act would be removed. Eventually, the act would just be thrown out. We would govern ourselves. And the state would be obliged to help us in rebuilding our nationhood. I believe as well that male violence against indigenous women would not be tolerated especially the sexual violence of prostitution. Two years ago, Canada's new prostitution law, the Protection of Community and Exploited Persons Act, was enacted to stop the male sexual demand for our bought bodies. Now it sits gathering dust in our nation's capital. The mayor of my hometown, well, he just says that he has higher priorities than to implement it. Yet again, Indigenous women are kicked to Canada's curb. And there are still parts of the bill which penalize women. It needs to be fully decriminalized for us. We have carried the brunt of the bill which penalize us. Pe which, we've carried the brunt of male crimes. We've been penalized for far too long for crimes we've never committed. In graduate school, when I was asked what the guiding vision of my work was, I said to live in a world without prostitution. I think my supervisor's eyes crossed at that moment. <laughs> um, but you know, it, it, was, it was my heart's desire that prostitution end then, and it's still my heart's desire today. And I know that it will not happen in my lifetime, and it probably won't happen in my daughter's, but it will. I feel within me that there's this growing groundswell. I can see it and I can feel it. It's a growing groundswell that rumbles our freedom. Thank you for asking me to speak here today. And um, I just know that every last girl will be first when we put a stop to prostitution. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will now give the floor to Fatima Katoun. Some of you have listened to her yesterday already. Fatima Katoun is a survivor of sexual exploitation, but also an advocacy leader from the Nat community. Uh, and I invite you to, to join the floor. Oh, where will you speak from? There? नमस्ते मेरा नाम फातिमा खातून है और मैं बिहार से आई हूं और मैं अपने आप का टीम हूं नमस्ते आई एम फातिमा खातून आई एम फ्रॉम बिहार एंड अ पार्ट ऑफ अपने आप टीम मैं नट जाति की बेटी हूं जैसे कि कल कुछ लोग मुझे सुन चुके हैं मैं नट जाति से हूं और मैं नट जाति की बहू भी हूं और बेटी भी हूं सो so, some of you, many of you have heard me yesterday. I am a daughter from the Nut community and also I am married to a Nut man. सबसे पहला है कि Nut की Nut में जब जो बेटी पैदा होती है हर अगर दूसरी समाज में बेटियां पैदा हो तो माता पिता को 
उसका जिम्मेदारी बढ़ जाता है कि वो अपनी बेटी के लिए पढ़ाई लिखाई अच्छे भविष्य से सोचता है और हमारी नट जाति में अगर बेटी पैदा हो तो बेटी को सोचना पड़ता है अपनी माता पिता अपनी भाई बहन का भविष्य सुशी सीज दैट व्हेन डॉटर इज बोर्न टू अ कॉमन फैमिली द पेरेंट्स टेक द रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी ऑफ एजुकेटिंग हर एंड ब्रिंगिंग हर अप बट इन आवर कम्युनिटी द मोमेंट अ गर्ल इज बॉर्न the entire responsibility of the family uh, comes on her aur nat ki jo beti hai wo na apni bachpan jee pati hai na hi koi sapna dekh pati hai kyunki uska ek hi sapna hota hai jo usse bachpan se diya jata hai ki use de vyapar mein jana hai use bikna hai kyunki dusre samaj use sirf khareedar matlab use khareedne ka saman samajhte hain so a girl who is born into nut community ceases to dream about her future because the rest of the other communities just sees her as an object who they can buy haath to badhate hain dusre samaj ke log nut ki jaat ke betiyon ki taraf par use bachane ke liye nahi use kharidne ke liye so the people from other community they uh, of course extend their hands to the girl from that community but not to protect her but to buy her buy her aur mera bas ek hi sapna tha ki jab dusre samaj ke log haath badhaye to ise khareedne ke liye nahi ise bachane ke liye aur ise samman dene ke liye kyunki samman ka jo adhikar hai wo sabko barabar ka hai to bas hame samman milna chahiye isliye agar dusre samaj ke log haath badhaye to hame samman dene ke liye khareedne ke liye nahi so i wanted to break this paradigm i thought that when uh, the peop i should reach out to the people of the mainstream society to tell them that you should protect the girls not buy them aur main apni nat ki jo pati hai bete baap hai bhai hai unko bhi batana chahti thi ki beti siri bikne ke liye paida nahi hoti hai wo mardon se kam का नहीं होती है वो मर्दों के साथ बराबरी में कदम से कदम मिला के चल सकती है इसलिए उसे ऐसा बनाए ताकि उसको समान में समाज में एक अस्तित्व हो और उनका वजूद बने आई ऑल्सो वॉन्टेड टू टेल द मेन इन आवर कम्युनिटी दैट दैट गिव रिस्पेक्ट टू द गर्ल्स इन योर कम्युनिटी एंड प्रोटेक्ट देम गिव देम अपॉर्चुनिटी और हमने इस लड़ाई को जारी किया ताकि किसी को ना किसी को लड़ना था और हमने अपने आप के साथ जब मिलकर इस लड़ाई को शुरू किया तो मुझे बहुत सारा इसका हर जाना भी भोगना पड़ा सो आई स्टार्टेड दिस बैटल एंड आई गॉट अपने आप से हेल्प इन माई फाइट एंड आई न्यू दैट आई हैड आई विल हैव टू सफर फॉर दिस फॉर टेकिंग अप द स्ट्रगल क्योंकि इस लड़ाई इतना आसान नहीं था क्योंकि हमारे समाज से लेके दूसरी समाज के लोग भी ये इसे बंद करना नहीं चाहता था तो कानून भी हमारा साथ नहीं देता था और इसके लिए मुझे मेरी बेटी को पुलिस वालों ने आधी रात को उठाया था और दो दिन अपनी पुलिस थाने में रखा इसलिए कि ताकि मैं इस लड़ाई को बंद कर दूँ एंड इट वॉज वेरी डिफिकल्ट टू सॉलिसिट support from the mainstream community uh, to the extent that even the police has uh, picked up my daughter my young 14 year old uh, daughter and kept her in the locker for two days so that i stop this fight mujhe apne hi ghar se ek mahine bahar rehna pada tha kyunki mujhe mera parivar jo hai wo mujhe ghar se nikal diya gaya diya tha taki main is ladai ko na ladu my own family has thrown me out of the house and for one month i stayed on the street but uh, they did it to me so that i stop fighting aur tabhi mere saath sirf tinku didi aur ruchira didi khada tha kyunki us uske baad kyunki main mera samajh mein nahi aata tha ki main ek mahine bahar kahan rahungi 
फिर रुचिरादित्य और टिंकू दीदी हमेशा ये बोलता था कि हम तुम्हारे साथ हैं तुम इस लड़ाई को जीतोगी सो इन इन ड्यूरिंग दैट स्ट्रगल इट्स रुचिरादि एंड टिंकू दी हुज ऑलवेज गिवन मी सपोर्ट एंड दी से दैट डोंट गिव अप योर स्ट्रगल वी आर विथ यू और मैंने सच में इस लड़ाई को जीता और बहुत आगे बढ़ी लेकिन आज भी समाज जो है जो ऊंचे पद में है नेता है मुखिया है सरपंच है कानून के ऊंचे ऊंचे पोस्ट पे जो है वो आज भी ये नहीं चाहता है कि इस लड़ाई को मैं लड़ूं और वो किसी लड़की को बचाने के लिए आगे आए सो इवन टुडे द विलेज काउंसिल द हेडमैन ऑफ द विलेज they don't want me to continue this struggle ek aurat matlab jo garib hai ya phir nat jati se hai ya jo kuch bhi nahi na padha likha na kuch ho agar woh ek ladai shuru karta hai to usse aasa hota hai ki hamara desh ka jo kanoon hai hamara jo samaj hai wo unki saath khade honge is hausle se khada hota hai aur jab kanoon jab unke saath एक भेदभाव के तरह दिखाना शुरू करता है कि वो उनकी घरेलू मामला है उनकी जात है वो उसमें ऐसा ही चलता है तो क्या होता है ना कि मतलब और भी नट की बेटी टूटने लगती है सो व्हेन द गर्ल फ्रॉम नट कम्युनिटी डजेंट रिसीव द सपोर्ट शी शुड गेट फ्रॉम द मेन स्ट्रीम सोसाइटी द सिस्टम uh it breaks her it breaks her hope it breaks her courage par apne aap ne auraton mein itni jaan bhar diya hai ki abhi nat ki beti jo hai wo darpuk nahi sherni hai sherni ban chuki hai aur ab to jo hai kyunki jab hamari jo ek mahila mandal jo bana hai jisko hum kal bole the ki ek anokha mahila mandal hai ye jo dono जात के है जो दूसरे समाज का है और नट जाति का है दोनों से एक महिला मंडल बना है बट नाउ आर वुमेन्स ग्रुप हैव कम टुगेदर एंड दे हैव दे हैव बिकम करेज लाइक टाइगर एंड एंड नाउ एंड द यूनिकनेस ऑफ आर वुमेन्स ग्रुप इज वी हैव ट्राई टू कम्बाइन द प्रोस्टिट्यूटेड वुमेन and the women from mainstream society aur us ladai ke dauran jo hai abhi kya hota hai ki bahar ki jo mahila hai wo bahar ki jo mard hai wo jo gandagi phaila raha tha use rokne mein kamyab karta hamari madad karta hai hamari jo mahila mandal hai jo lalwati area ke hai jis pe zabardasti hota tha wo abhi jo hai kuch bhi hone ke baad apne aap mein aata hai aur hum log jo hai unki jo bhi hai जो थाना में हो या कानून के जरिए हो या हमारी संगठन से है हम उनको इतनी मजबूत करते हैं ताकि उनकी जो बच्ची है उनको स्कूल तक पहुंचाते हैं ताकि वो बच्ची दोबारा आके लालबत्ती एरिया में ना फंस के वो दे व्यापार में ना जाए सो दैट यूनिकनेस दैट कनेक्शन हैज मेड इट पॉसिबल फॉर द मेन द सोसाइटी ऑफ द वीमेन फ्रॉम मेन स्ट्रीम कम्युनिटीज टू फाइट the men in their uh, houses and they it has made them so st- strong that now they come to us when they are in trouble and we uh, so we solve it together and we try and they also fight for protection of their girls so no girl gets prostituted kyunki hamari jo samaj hai वो जो है बिल्कुल कटा हुआ है और वहाँ का मर्द किसी से लड़ नहीं सकता है तो औरत क्या लड़ेगा सो द कम्युनिटी विच आई बिलोंग टू इज टोटली एक्सक्लूडेड सो इवन द मेन इन इन दिस फ्रॉम दिस कम्युनिटी आर हेल्पलेस सो यू कैन इमेजिन द सिचुएशन ऑफ द वीमेन आज हमने एक ऐसे लड़ाई को शुरू किए हैं कि हम जो है ना कानून से डरते हैं ना हमारी जो नेता है जो बड़े बड़े दलालों के सर पे हाथ रखता है हम उनसे भी नहीं डरते हैं क्योंकि हमें अपना अधिकार लेना है तो डर को ख़त्म करना पड़ेगा
But today, we have come to resolve that we have to be courageous and uh, we have been uh, successful in our journey. So today, neither we are uh, scared of the lawmakers or the police or whoever is big in the society. और हमने इस लड़ाई को जारी किया था एक हमारी गांव के पास ही एक रामपुर था एक ऐसा दमंग एरिया जहां पे कोई मतलब कोई भी समाज वहां पे जाने के लिए डरता था और नॉट जाती तो कभी घुस घुस भी नहीं पाएगा ऐसा समाज था वो सो वी स्टार्टेड दिस स्ट्रगल फ्रॉम द विलेज व्हिच इज नेक्स्ट टू अस व्हिच इज फुल ऑफ क्रिमिनल्स एंड द मेन देयर आर सो Uh, oppressive that uh, uh, all other communities were they were scared to enter in, into that village aur hamari jo jitni bhi nat ki beti hai aurte hain mard hai kisi ke paas na voter id card na ration card kuch bhi nahi tha aur hamare jo ration milte hain jo sarkari taraf se wo bhi nahi tha kuch bhi nahi tha to hum logon ne je mahila mandal banaye to sabse pehla plan tha ki hame ration lena hai और हम लोगों ने ठाना था कि हम लोग मिट्टी के तेल लेके आएंगे क्योंकि पहला लड़ाई हमारा यही है कि हम बिना रास बिना काट के क्योंकि अगला वो तो दिया ही नहीं है हमें कार्ड तो मेरे पास कार्ड कहाँ से आएगा लेकिन मिट्टी का तेल लेना है चाहे किसी भी हालत में सो नन ऑफ एस हैड राशन कार्ड्स और वोटर कार्ड्स बट वी नीडेड द केरोसिन एंड दैट वेर अवेलेबल ओनली थ्रू द राशन कार्ड दो वी डिट है दिट बट वी वी had to have this access to kerosene oil aur phir hum logon ne rampur gaya aur wahan ka jo ek dealer hota hai jo baarte hain chawal dal tel unko bola ki bhaiya hame kerosene ka tel chahiye to bola aapke paas card hai bpl ka hum logon ne bola ki ha apne diye nahi to hamare paas aayenge kahan se so when i when we went to the dealer and asked for our quota of kerosene the fuel uh, he uh, declined and he said that you don't have ration card uh, so i i told them that well you have never given us the ration card phir un logon ne bahut zor zor se hansa bola un logon ne socha ki bahut bewakuf hai card to hai hi nahi tel lene ke liye aaya hai phir un logon ne dusre panchayat bhej diya hum logo ko ki bola ye is panchayat mein nahi milega dusre panchayat jaiye aap log so they thought us a as a bunch of fools they laughed at us and they have sent us to another village aur humne dusre panchayat bhi gaya wahan ka bhi dealer yahi sawal kiya ki aapke paas ration card hai hum logon ne bola nahi lekin phir bhi hame mitti ke tel chahiye and that person also asked us for the ration card and uh, we said that we don't have it but we need the ration card uh, we need the kerosene uske baad un logon ne matlab bola theek hai theek hai क्योंकि हम लोग जो है बाईस औरत थे और सबके हाथ में एक गिलन था जो मिट्टी का तेल लेते हैं उसका गिलन था और उसने बोला हम मुखिया से बात करते हैं सो ही टोल दर आई टॉक टू द हेड मैन ऑफ द काउंसिल विलेज काउंसिल एंड वी वर ट्वेंटी टू वेमेन देयर विथ वन कंटेनर ईच होल्डिंग वन कंटेनर टू हैव द केरोसिन इन इट फिर उसने मुखिया को फोन पे बोल रहा है कि सर कुछ लालवती एरिया से मतलब बेसियाई आए हैं वो तेल मांग रहे हैं क्या दे सो ही आस्ट हिज हेडमैन सर ट्वेंटी टू प्रोस्टिट्यूट फ्रॉम द विलेज हैव कम टू आस्क फॉर केरोसिन ऑयल शुड आई गिव देम उसके बाद क्या था क्योंकि हमारे जो गुस्सा था वो सर के बाहर आ गया और हम लोगों ने जितने भी हाथ में गीलन था जितना भी औरतों के हाथ में हमने सब उसके ऊपर पीटना शुरू कर दिए सो देन वी वी वर रियली एंग्री बाय दैट टाइम एंड वी हैव बीन सो एंग्री व्हेन वी हर्ड इट वी ऑल द ट्वेंटी टू वीमेन हैव स्टार्टेड बीटिंग दैट डीलर विथ द एम कंटेनर मतलब हम लोग को समझ में भी नहीं आया था कि दूसरे आई में है दूसरे समाज में है और उसे पीटेंगे तो हमारा क्या होगा ये सब कुछ भूल गए और बहुत सारा सब औरत मिलके उसे इतना पीटे कि वो क्रिएशन का तेल भी दिया हमारा बीपीएल भी बनाया हमारा राशन कार्ड भी बनाया हमारा आईडी कार्ड भी बनाया सो दिस हैज फोर्स द विलेज काउंसिल टू नॉट ओनली गिव अस केरोसिन ऑन दैट डे 
they were eventually fo were forced to give us the BPL card, the ration card, and everything. उसके बाद अगर आज आज जो है अगर किसी चीज का जरूरत पड़ता है तो सिर्फ मुखिया सरपंच को कॉल कर देते हैं कि हमारा महिला मंडल को ये चीज का जरूरत है तो वो समझ जाता कि अपने आप का टीम यहाँ ना पहुँचे इससे पहले वहाँ पहुँचा दो भैया So now they are so scared that when we call, just make a phone call, so they immediately respond so that we don't reach there. और हमने इसी तरह लड़ते हुए केबीसी का हॉट सीट तक गए और कौन बनेगा करोड़पति में 25 लाख जीत के भी आए हैं और केबीसी का हॉट सीट पे मेरे लिए खेलने के लिए रानी मुखर्जी आए थे and and slow eventually i reached to the hot seat of uh, who become who wants to become the millionaire and uh, i had actress famous bollywood actress rani mukherjee uh, with me to play the game uske baad mujhe kbc ka hot seat pe mardani ka award bhi mila aur mardani ka naam mila so uh, in in that uh, show i also received the title of uh, mardani what does that mean the courageous woman courageous. the courageous woman i received the award and the name to bhaiya pehle aatankvad ka naam tha ab mardani ka naam hai to main ye kehna chahun ki hamari jitni bhi aurte hain jitni bhi behne hain hum sab mardani hain aur ye sabit kar chuke hain kyunki mardon se chheene nahi hai मर्द से मांग के नहीं लिए हैं वो उनका जो मर्दानी है वो हम लोगों ने छीन लिया है अगर किसी मर्द को इस पर कोई आपत्ति हो तो हमारी औरतों का कोई भी रोल निभा के देखे हम अपनी औरत का जो रोल है उनको देने के लिए तैयार है भैया सो सो यू नो वॉट एवर दे कॉल आस मर्दानी और वॉट एवर सो ये सो ये स्टडे शी टॉक अबाउट दैट people uh, call her as terrorist and and also mardani the which is a little difficult to, to translate anyone can can anyone help me with the translation like the you are like a man okay so you are like a man uh, so she said that uh, whatever you whatever you call me that doesn't make any difference uh, so you give me this name because i fought and i have not extracted i have not snatched away this from you you were forced to uh, give it to me so uh, so and i also challenge them that first you do all the work all the chores all the responsibilities which the women perform and then you can call me whatever you want सॉरी क्योंकि टाइम नहीं है मतलब वक्त का पाबंदी है इसलिए हम आपको बता नहीं पा रहे हैं इसलिए हम अपना जो है यहीं समाप्त करते हैं क्योंकि बताने के लिए तो बहुत कुछ है इसलिए टाइम ही नहीं है सॉरी सो विद दिस आई कंक्लूड माय स्पीच बिकॉज देर इज नो टाइम थैंक्स थैंक यू वेरी मच फैसी मैट जी फॉर यूर वेरी इंस्पायरिंग एंड पॉवरफुल presentation i will ask you all to uh, respect the time frame because we have five more speakers and we want to leave room for the q and a's so okay uh in my introduction i was making reference to several very uh, specifically discriminated groups indigenous women uh, dalit women uh, refugees victims of sexual exploitation and incest and uh, another very discriminated groups is the youth and young teenagers young girls in particular uh, all over the world are the primary targets and the primary victims of sexual exploitation and of prostitution and that's why we thought it would make uh, a lot of sense to invite Dee Clark who comes from uh, Portland Maine and who was in the USA who was trafficked uh, at the age of 12 if i'm not wrong by two pimps so we wanted to also bring this perspective of the specific targeting of young girls because a 12 year girl uh, by the pimps and uh, dick clark uh, was not uh, only uh, a survivor of, of sexual exploitation but is the founder of an organization called survivor speak in the usa thank you so much for uh, coming i'm glad to give you the floor
Thank you. I'm really honored to be here. And it would be the right thing to do is to thank the people that brought me here. I went from 12 minutes to 8 minutes. So forgive me for not doing the formalities. But yes, at age 12, my brother took me to a party. My brother was a few years older than me. The party was filled with adults. At 12 years old, I flirted with a man. He flirted back. He offered me to go home with him to have breakfast, and he'd bring me back. At 12 years old, I said, OK. We get to his house. He tells me to take off my clothes and get in the bed. At 12 years old, I said, OK. I didn't resist anything. We can talk about that after. Um, but after he sexed me, he gave me to a pimp who was down the hall. It was a rooming house. The pimp had another woman there. She was pregnant. She was also prostituted. And she became my wife-in-law. Today, they don't call it that. They call the woman that helps to keep you in place the bottom bitch. But this was when I was 12. So the wife-in-law taught me every possible sex act, sex act as there was. And they brought men to that house to have sex with me. It wasn't on my mind. It didn't occur to me till today in my advocacy work. Those men were happy that I was 12 years old. It wasn't about tricking them and fooling them and acting older. They were glad. Um, the only reason I escaped is they kidnapped another girl. She was 15 from Providence, Rhode Island, and she convinced me to run away climbing over a porch. The whole time she was trying to convince me it was in code because we weren't allowed to talk to each other, and I kept saying no, but I did it. That was pimp number one. When I came home, though, that was the difficult part. I fell apart. I wasn't 12 anymore. I didn't want to play with my Barbie dolls and hang out with my girlfriends. I wanted to beat people up. So every girl, it didn't matter if they could beat my ass, I still picked a fight with them. Um, I became very violent. I became really promiscuous. So now instead of them selling me, I was giving it to everybody, all grown men. Um, and then I became very quickly a stripper by hitchhiking with this other girl who later also got prostituted and her baby was killed by her pimp. So I become a stripper at age 13 and I stayed in the combat zone, which was the red light district, from age 13 to 20. And that was my childhood, 12 years old to 20. Um, when I was 15, I thought I was going to have a boyfriend with this other adult man, and he was a pimp. As soon as I realized it, I tried to get away. I spent my days trying to get away. But even though I was walking the hostel, because that's what we called it in the United States back then, when we went onto a street, to walk, and that's where men came by looking for women to, or girls to buy sex from. We call it the hoe stroll because I was a hoe, and I sold them sex. And they made more money off me that way because it was nonstop. Um, I didn't run away. I didn't get in a cab. I had too much fear. But when I finally did, the beating was horrendous, and the only reason that we separated, and I felt like, hmm, maybe I can leave, was because it was so bad I had to go to the hospital, and then I went to my mother's house. Anyway, I go back to the combat zone. I go back to stripping nonstop. My point is, I never had a childhood. We're talking about the last girl. Highly unlikely, I'm learning. No matter what country, the last girl probably had the childhood I had. And instead of having childhood development, I had victimhood v development. That first pimp living in that house, it was no different from living in my mother's house. My mother did tell me she loved me. She played, um, she cut out little um, paper dolls for me. But she also beat me, spit on me, kicked me, burnt me. Her boyfriends molested me. I was surrounded by violence and drugs and alcohol. We were neglected at age five and six in the housing project. Nobody knew where I was playing hide and seek with the older boys who were doing stuff to us. I missed the milestones, those childhood developmental milestones that help a child you know, figure out their safe place in their home, their safe place in their community, you know, through um, just the normal activities that child even in the like average childhood, they're able to shape a personality that goes from their youth through adolescence to adults. People like me, we didn't do that. We were shaped into victimhood that went from our childhood into our ad adolescence into my adulthood. So 20 years, how did I get out? I meet a Chinese man. 
He spoke no English. So how did he communicate with me? We went to the Chinese restaurant, the dishwasher came out and translated. I left with him, the combat zone in Boston, went to Maine, and in Maine, <laughs> I straightened my hair, I called myself Mei Ling, and I made up this accent and said I was from Guam. And whenever I talked about my parents, and whenever I talked about anything, I built a life of someone that was never abused, never spit on, ne never anything, never screwed, whatever you want to call it, by Tom, Dick, and Harry and his cousins. I just built this fake life, and I lived it for a long time and had two children. But through my rearing of my children, I discovered I didn't want to be Mei Ling. I wanted to be me. How do I tell these women it's not true? How do I stop speaking with this accent? It was very difficult, but at some point I was able to do that. My point to even tell you that is to come through that kind of life. You don't just... It's all over, and you're okay. You look, you're free, you're okay. I fell apart, I had PTSD, dissociation. The mental health that came with this. Ashley spoke about it. It's a lot of work, a lot, a lot of work. I was fortunate at the time in the United States, in Maine, that I was able to access Maine Care, which is free health care, that helped me access the best trauma therapy. So today, I have survivors speak. I meet many women who are presently on the track, walking where you can purchase sex and sell sex, right in front of my house. They're my friends and I love them. I also meet women that are deemed trafficked, forced fraud, coercion, because of law enforcement. It could be a street bust that they were watching a hotel. It could be a Homeland Security. It could be FBI, but they bring women out. Sometimes they sit in jail too long and I meet them. So I meet two groups of women that are oppressed. In Maine and United States likes to separate these women. Some are real victims. They've been trafficked. They have a case. We're going to lock up a pimp. Those women are not victims. Those are sex workers. They do that by choice, the women in front of my house. They're not sex workers, and they're not there by choice. Exploitation is never a choice, ever. Can I say one more thing? Please. So the, <laughs> It's hard to do this in eight minutes. So the challenges, the most difficult part which survivors speak now, I need my allies, I need my big sisters, is that I have a lot of collaborative community partners, including a very well-known um, state organization, nonprofit, that oversees all the sexual assault response services in Maine. And they're good people. And they've been writing legislation and doing all kinds of advocacy work around sexual violence. But now they take on human trafficking, and they get grants and they do a lot of work. They want to create the legislation. They want to organize survivors, you know? They want to tell the media how to call me and how to call my friends without us there. So that little brief time when I didn't have a pimp and I decided to just sell sex anyway, was I not being exploited? Was I not a victim? You know, <laughs> these are my challenges to try to move forward with the same group of women that won because of the United States Department of Justice grant. They get specialized case management, and they're able to help them to get housing and basic needs. But the other women who are on the street in front of my house, they don't get nothing. They get arrested, and they languish in emergency homeless shelters. That's it. And they die, and some are addicted. One minute. Uh, so I'll take this one minute then. The, my one minute is, thank you, Ruchira. I met her because she came to the United States. She came to Maine. But before I met her, she was going to come to this lecture series, Justice for Women, that's pretty big in Maine. Um, and this woman, Kathy Lee, holds it at Maine Law School. And um, she sorted me out, seeked me, and I didn't want anything to do with it. And, and I love public speaking. I just didn't want to introduce somebody from India so she can come to Maine, and Maine people would be excited, like they always do when it's another country, and, and give her props and give her money. I wanted someone to give a shit about the women in front of my house that languish in shelters, that die, that get beat up, like the rapes you talked about. It's terrible. So I didn't want to do that. And, but I was begged by somebody else, so I decided to do some research. And everything I read about you was phenomenal. But the thing that got me is that you were making friends and hugging and kissing your sisters that were prostituted. 
and they were loving you back, and they were sticking up for you too. And I said, wow, she's doing something right if they love her back. Because many people like to meet people like me because we're a novelty, you know? But anyway, so I'm grateful I've come full circle because I understand the sisterhood, and I understand it's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. Race, gender, and economic status, and then abuse of children. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dick Clark, for your very uh, enlightening and eloquent presentation. Uh, we will now give the floor to Griselda Grotboom, uh, who is a survivor of trafficking human beings and prostitution from South Africa. Uh, she's also a member of Embrace Dignity, CAP International Member Organization in South Africa, and the author of Exit, uh, a book that was re released in April 2016. Thank you very much for participating in our Congress, Griselda. It's a honor. Sorry, I have to sting for all my sisters in Africa. It calms me when you stand here after a whole lot of years of slavery. You don't feel that you deserve to be here when you've lost all the other ones. My name is Grizelda Grootboom, a mixture of German, Khoisan, and Kosa. Reason being of all of that, at the age of eight, we were removed during the ARPA date in South Africa, Western Cape, Cape Town, District 6, Woodstock. After that, we joined the rest of the street, kids on the streets in Cape Town. At the age of nine, I got to meet my mother in the township of Kailicha, Site C, in Cape Town, Western Cape. She had her own family, she had her own life. But because I was looking for a home, I located her. She was not happy about the fact that I reigned her picker fence, happy home, husband, two kids. In the family, she called me the outcast of one of her brother's kids. I could only speak Afrikaans because I came from the District 6. The township Kailicha was spoken Kosa. And for me to learn Kosa, I was introduced by the gang rape we call in Kosa, Ifoli. You get gang raped by four guys, and that's how you get introduced to the township. When I walked down the street in Makoba Street, holding my dress, there were two or three women at their gates speaking is Kosa saying, Aumameli meaning for your age, you can jump ropes and hold your skirt so boys can see you. That's why you get gang raped. And she was a mother and she was a woman. And that was enough stigma for me to join the rest of my generation that was removed from apartheid on the streets. We got introduced to glue and tennis, which we sucked out of the bottle to keep us high and our minds numb. Petrol was enough for us to stay alive. We were introduced to gangsterism, meaning you need to stay high, to stay awake, to survive in the streets. I guess our only moment as street kids was when Tata Nelson Mandela came out and we were on the streets, on the parade of Cape Town. It was a happy moment for the whole country but we street kids, we were still there, and we decided to pickpocket everybody that's celebrating freedom 
but don't see us. By the time they got their freedom, they needed to go and do some new passports and IDs because we had all their bags. <laughs> but that they screamed the word of freedom so loud that even us, when we were high, <laughs> we really wanted it. We stayed in a shelter called Onsplek Shelter. It was probably the only shelter that was in existence in Cape Town, close to Parliament. That same shelter was close to a police station where we could probably get locked up all the time for stealing stuff. And for us to get out of that police station, we had to give every cop a blowjob. And that's how they released us. When I turned 18, the shelter said, there's no bed for you anymore, so it's time to go. During my gangsterism, I met quite a lot of rich kids that felt like, you know what? The street kids could give us quick access to drugs. Through that, I had a great relationship with one girl. And with that, coming into our territory as the 26 and the 28, I had to keep on protecting her against my peers and men. It's like, no, she's just a rich kid looking for access. With that, we became so close. She left to go and study in Johannesburg, in UJ. And I remember saying, can I come through to see you? Because my life in Cape Town is done here. And she said, yeah, for sure. Didn't waste any time, stood on the robots, <laughs> gave some professors some blowjobs, collected my money, got myself a black six pack of black label, a lot of weed, glue, and tennis, so I can take the train from Cape Town to Johannesburg, which takes two days. When I got to Johannesburg Park Station, I met her. I could really pick up on the body language of, hmm, you at my mercy. Who am I to ask? I'm just a street kid from a survivor level. Looking forward to the city of Johannesburg with my friend, we drove to Hutton, Yeovil, into a flat, and I still remember the smell of the house. You know when you're a street kid, the only smell you're used to is tennis, urine, but you walk into a house, you get so excited because the house smells like home. With that, I passed out and she said she was getting me a meal and that was the last time I saw her. In my passing out of sleeping, the first thing I felt was a kick in my stomach, a punch in my face and being undressed, tied up and duct tape around my eyes. I think my spirit went numb and I thought the house is getting robbed. Johannesburg is getting very well known with its crime of house robbing and hijacking. When that happened, I kept on thinking she's coming back because the house is getting robbed. With all of that happening, I found myself naked, tied up, duct tape around my eyes. They gave me two ecstasies and two needles behind my knees with morphine. You know, when the ladies give birth, they numb you? I had that and customers started coming in. So my legs wouldn't resist whenever they get spread out wide. I started picking up on main senses and that's how I started counting the time. That's how I started counting the days. There were a lot of times where I wish they could just choke me already and I could just OD and it's out. I was exchanged with a younger girl in the middle of the night at 12. And I could just hear the innocence of her scream that she doesn't even come from the streets. Then, kicked out, animal instinct kicked in. My mind and body was grown already to be an animal of survival in the streets. So when I got to Jobik and that happened, kicked out in the house at 12 o'clock, I had to start waking up and survive. The first thing I did was go to the nearest truck stop get myself a client, and get myself dressed up and get ready to join the rest of the girl of prostitution on the streets of Hillbro and Yovo. The pimps can smell you when you're fresh meat. They didn't waste their time, and the older girls didn't even waste their time too. They're like, babe, we would rather let you really get fucked in an expensive way than a cheap way. So get your way to the biggest pimp and move around. That happened from 18 
to 26, one province to another. Low class prostitution, middle class prostitution, high prostitution. Sometimes we were excited to be sitting in gentlemen's clubs because at least we'll get more drugs that we don't have to pay for. And all the ministers and their business partners that's visiting our country can enjoy their sex. But those were the most of the times they make porn movies at the same time. At the age of 26, I was working for a brothel in Port Elizabeth. And I think that was one of the most money-making year of my life, because I was the only black girl with the original double D breast. <laughs> so when we had the AFCON of Africa soccer, the guys are like, those are real breasts and those are not, let's have this one. But then also I got pregnant with Summer, my baby girl. I called her Summer because after working a whole shift, Eight, seven in the morning, you get to feel the sun on your skin and she's still alive and kicking. But then the madam said to me, you know, this is not the kind of deal I made with your boss. I brought him drugs in the country and he brought me to you. So this baby needs to go. With that, abortion took place. And two hours later, they asked me to put body sponge that you use in the shower to hold the blood so that the next customer don't feel it. And the warmth of that sponge blood going through my vagina, sitting at the bar while the girls are like, we don't understand why they let you give six months. Maybe she should have given you abortion two months. It became such a norm. And that's where I felt that the word no needs to come out. And when I said no, I got beaten up because I knew the whole system of the brothel. Meaning every third week, there was a raid. We get locked up and then we get taken out. And then they drove me all the way from Port Elizabeth back to Johannesburg. And I woke up a month later in the hospital, extremely angry that I'm still alive. There's no part of the country and there's no part of the system and there's no part of the NGOs that I don't know in my life as a sex slave from the age of nine. Why the fuck am I still alive? Made it through for one year of rehab. Three months of solidarity and during rehab, meaning every nurse couldn't walk into my room because I'm gonna choke her because I can feel, I can smell. Made it through the first session of human race talk, meaning when you sit in a circle, you say hi, that means your mind senses are kicking in and you're not on drugs anymore. 27, went through that. 28, I got a place to stay at a shelter where newborn babies were brought in. They were dumped by their parents. So for me to have a place to stay, I had to wash every baby and rock them to sleep. And when that happened, I just remember that every child can actually sleep in my arms. I was like, shit, you need to do something with your life. Because these guys are depending on you. It was still a journey. South Africa did not have a system for us 29-year-old women to have a place to stay. South Africa didn't even have a shelter. It only had its own little religious charity soup tables and blankets and five rent for you to go and stay in a shelter with mail again. Going with that, join the streets again. This time Marana started cooking and packing drugs for the pimps and they told me straight up, it's just a period of time for your body to recover. With that, I had an opportunity to drop drugs back at home in Cape Town. And that was my moment of escape. Got home with 10,000 rands, got through the airport with the drugs, got to my mom, gave her the money. She was going through her own struggle of oppression, living in a shack with two boys and a case of beer to sell. 
and going through her own stages of HIV and loss of her husband. I had no reason to judge. I just gave her the money and asked, can I stay here and hide? It was a shack, for goodness sake. How can you hide? But I did. Started carrying every face that I washed and bath and rocked to sleep in my head. Started feeling the hope of faith of that I made it alive at 29 back in Kailicha Township. And then figured out, okay, let's do this church thing. It was the same thing. Well, I know how the system goes, so I might as well survive through it. With that, then they had the first job I had was to act like a prostitute in a movie of a production team from Nigeria where they were trying to do an awareness. And they said to me, do you mind acting like a prostitute but you're not gonna get paid? I was like, what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> this can work, surviving. I did it and they never knew who I was. And when they launched the movie, there was a room full of NGOs, political government people, sitting in the room that's about to discuss my issue they don't know of. They just thought I was an actor. Hell yeah, I am. I've got qualification in it. 26 years being an actor through Sex Slave. Yeah. I got that. Academy Award. Yeah, yeah. But I stood at that conference and I looked at everybody. I'm like, there's no survivors in this room. And these niggas are talking about issues. <laughs> They're crazy. <laughs> Some religious people, too. <laughs> but I stood up and I like, I'm going to talk about the experience of how to act in this movie. I'm going to talk about this whole religious scripture that you guys talk about, a woman being a prostitute. And around her, she had political parties, she had government, she had community, she had society. But they still judged and stigmatized her. So what is there to talk about when we come from 100 years about the same issue when we're not doing any action? When I was done with that speech, that's where I met a young girl called Marianne. And she was working at Embrace Dignity. And when she said Embrace Dignity, I was like, dignity, like, dignity. There's actually an organization out there <laughs> saying that women is possible to have dignity. Please show me where this organization is. And Mr. Jeremy Routledge, the director of Embrace Dignity, was running a workshop with men in the township of Kailicha and asking them, how do they feel when they sleep with prostitutes? I was so excited. I was like, please, can I be at that workshop? I need to be there. <laughs> and then I met Nozizwe Routledge, the founder of Embrace Dignity, a woman that has fought in South African government 40 years. I'm like, these people do exist in my country? She sat in front of me, looked at me. What do you want to do with your life? How do you want to get back your dignity? Whatever you want, we have the exit program. And then two years wrote the book called Exit. The sign Exit was everywhere in every brothel I worked. It was a red light. The whole place is dark. You don't walk through it. Customers do. And the book had to be titled Exit since I have. But it's still the journey. <laughs> because there's still porn clips about myself in South African internet. But the growth of me standing and have exited, it's so peaceful and joyful when I'm in a room with young people and make that space a safe space for them to speak up. And the young people are done with political talks. They want their right and must of right back. And when they do that for me, I feel like they are one of those girls <laughs> that I bath and rock to sleep. I feel like I'm good. But the challenges are still happening. Still have to wake up every night at the age of 36 and one day I didn't wet my bed. Still have to wear a pamper through my PMS because yes, there's still boils growing around my vagina. Still have to worry if I do sit in a room or go to the bathroom and take off my panties, my discharge does not smell the whole place. Still have to walk around in society and women laugh at my double D breasts, forgetting 
During prostitution, our madams used to give us injections for our breasts to become bigger. And you look at men thinking, oh, those are big. And men look at you thinking, oh, they're laughing at her too, so she might as well be delicious. Why? Why global woman? Why are you sitting in a position in your office and not voicing the pain that you feel with me? You understand the pain of labor, you understand the pain of PMS, but you cannot understand my pain? Why global woman? And the only voice that can be voices to everything of sex slave is a survivor. We have a great survivor movement and we refuse for you to talk. Embrace Dignity refuses for you to talk on the behalf of survivors. You don't have a right. Like the presidents, they don't have a right to even talk about what they think about us as survivors. When there's a choice in your life, you decide. And when it comes to sex life, a young last girl don't have a choice. Because men dominate in every area. Every country. Even in a freaking brothel security guy, up to a government bodyguard. So the only action that needs to be done is going forward and prove to them that there are survivors, there are testimonies to get this right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Griselda. Uh, my English is not sophisticated and rich enough to express how much we appreciate each of your presentations. I think it's uh, important to say this at this stage. Uh, I think listening to you from Canada, from India, from uh, South Africa, from the USA, is the best illustration of the universality of both the patriarchal sexual oppression and exploitation that takes place all over the world, but also the universality of uh, your mobilizations all over the world to uh, end this uh, male sexual oppression and exploitation. So thank you for this. And we will now give the floor to Anjali Daimari, who belongs to the Bodo Indigenous Committee, Community in, uh, from Assam. Uh, Anjali Daimari is the founder of the Bodo, in, the Bodo Women's Justice Forum, and she was uh, she's a Sahitya Academy awardee. Thank you so much, Anjali, for joining us. Respected moderator, distinguished guests, speakers, and the representative coming from different countries. First of all, I bring greetings from the people of Assam. Secondly, I would like to thank the APNEA for inviting me in this Congress. It is my privilege to be here in this very special conference where we are getting opportunity to speak for ourselves, for women, for girls. I really like and embrace the motto of APNEAP, that is, last girl first. Yeah. It reminds me the traditional belief and saying of my community, that is, Boro community. It says, Unjanaya Agelja, Ageljanaya Unja. It means, who are in the first will be in the last, and who are in the last 
will be in the first. Similarly, the last girl will be in first, I believe. Girls are precious, girls are wealth, girls are our home, future, our strength. Without women and girls, there cannot be family, there cannot be society, there cannot be culture, tradition, or customs. Then why women and girls are neglected? Why women are treated as commodity? Can we think of selling our home, family, society? Can we sell our culture, tradition, customs? We cannot sell them, and nobody would do that. Then why are women and girls are being sold? How is it possible? How can we destroy our own home, our own family, society, culture, traditions, or customs? In India, Assam, the state I belong, has got highest number of crime related to human trafficking. According to NCRB, National Crime Record Bureau, in the year of 2016, 1,449 cases related to human trafficking were registered. And out of these 99 cases were women trafficking. The population of Assam is 3.22 crore, and if we see the ratio, Assam has the most high number of cases in whole country. Ministry of Women and Child Development coming up with legislation to tackle human trafficking as an organized crime. The draft of the Trafficking Persons Bill 2016, which includes prevention, protection, and, and rehabilitation is ready, and suggestions are being invited from different states and sections of society, but yet to reach many concerned groups and organizations, those who are involved in human trafficking cases. Governments should take speedy initiative, otherwise the number of victims will keep increasing. There should not be any doubt or hesitation to introduce a new law to prevent human trafficking and the law should be practiced in true sense. We also need to see the reasons why it happens so often, especially in our area. In case of Assam, there are many factors which leading to human trafficking. The frequent floods, lack of education, lack of employment, poverty, militancy, etc., make people most vulnerable to trafficking. Most of the victims are belong to the poor family and tribal communities who are lured away by traffic, trafficker with promise of good education, better job, better salaries, or with promise of marriage. Tribal people are really, really very simple, and the trafficker take advantage of this simplicity always. Last year in 2016, one very rare case came to light, which was shocking to the people of Assam. It was done in a very, very organized manner. 31 tribal minor girls were trafficked to Gujarat and Punjab by Seva Varti, a so-called social service organization affiliated to Rastriya Sayam Sevak Sangha, RSS, in June 2015, to initiate them to Hinduism. The unfortunate part was that the children were handed over by two local women who were associated with Seva Varti. The 31 girls were belong to Boro and Santal communities from Kokrajar district, Assam. The age group of the girls was between eight to 14 years. These four girls were trafficked to instill Hindu values. When the whole thing came to light, then it was said that they were taken for the better education and to give them the Hindu values. India is the biggest democratic and secular country in the world. But in reality, what is happening? The tribal people or tribal communities have got their own religion. They have their own faith. For example, Boros, we are having our own religion called Batho. Even now, the Boros get government holiday for the Batho Puja. 
What is the intention of not allowing to follow their own religion? The records tells that these girls were not put in any proper schools. They were being taught local languages and culture. They were taught about patriarchal ideas of honor, satis, the sati practice, etc., instead of our rich culture, tradition, custom. The parents and the family members were not allowed to communicate them for more than one year. If these organizations uh, really, truly social organization, and they really work for the welfare of the poor society, why cannot educate them, the children in their own home state? Why they cannot, they cannot support financially to get education in their home town or in their home state? Here I would like to just uh, mention one incident. From 2001 to 2004, one girl was working in our family to help in our household work. And suddenly in 2004, she said that I want to go home. I said, okay. But after one year, I heard that she's no more. She's dead. How it happened? After she left my house, she was brought to Bangalore for some work telling her that she'll get more salary. But after spending six months, she died. No one knows how she died and what she used to work. Even her dead body could not be brought to her house because her family was very poor. When the parents get money, sometimes parents also, they never question their children, their daughters, how she earns, how she gets money. In Northeast, I, I, I just want to share this, that in Northeast, women are sexually exploited in two ways. One is trafficking, and one is by the security forces. Of course, it is a bit, a bit unrelated, but I, might, I must mention this. In the name of militant, to control the militancy, many black laws are imposed in the region, our Northeast India region. For example, we can mention the Armed Forces Special Power Act, APSPA, 1958. Under this law, a non-commissioned officer also killed the man without any prior warning, just in mere suspicion. In the name of operation against the militants, security forces go to villages and rape women and girls. They do not even spare 60 years old woman and nine years old minor girl. There are instances of raping pregnant women too. As a result, one pregnant woman, after getting raped by security personnel, gave birth to a dead son, dead baby. Another woman who was raped in front of the handicapped husband by army personnel became pregnant and gave birth to a son. The family was very poor. They even could not send the son to school when he started growing. My organization took responsibility to send him to school. But when he grown, the problem came. That was a major problem for that boy, for which he didn't want to go to school. The problem was that the boy does not look like indigenous, does not look like Boro boy. He looks like non-tribal. He looks like Nepali. The reason was His mother was raped by a Nepali army personnel. Nepali Juwan belongs to Gurkha regiment. So he looked like a Nepali. He looks. So everyone used to tease him in school. You are not Boro. You don't look like Boro. You are a Nepali. Your mother is this, that, that, that. So he stopped going to school. Just one year back in 2015, it was 9th August. The whole world was celebrating International Day of World's Indigenous People. We were also celebrating with a day long program nicely in our place. But the same night, one seventh month pregnant, 
lady was raped by Army Juan in Kukrazar district. It is sad to say that many newly married women, mother of one month old baby, also are raped. I believe that. The whole world is aware about Iram Sharmila, the Iron Lady of Manipur, who was on fasting protest for 16 years, demanding on repealing the Black Law, APSPA Armed Forces Special Power Act from the region. Because like Assam in Manipur also, daily innocent women and girls were raped and killed by security forces. In our society, the status of women is very high, but by the different forces and elements, women have been always sexually exploited. I wonder when our leaders, our society, would know that women are the pillar of everything. Women, when our people will realize that progress for women is progress for all. I would like to wind up with my own story. When I was 14 years old, after the 10th standard exam, that is metric exam, while waiting for the result, I joined in one school, which was run by army authority. It was eight kilometers far from my village. I used to work daily. Then near that school, there was a weekly market. And to that market, from my village also people used to go for the marketing. Then one day, my, our, one of our helper, she, she also went to that market. And that very day when I came back from school, she said that, sister, you stop going to school from tomorrow. I said, why? Today I heard in the market talking about you that you have been sold to one army jawan. Then I didn't, I, I didn't believe. Then she started crying, don't go. I have heard everyone were talking in the market. Tomorrow when you go to school and while coming back around 1.30, the school gets over, the army will come and pick you up from the road. We discussed at home. Next day I went to school, school and two of my elder brothers followed me and then they were inside the school, one room in Chakwidar's room. Then after school, when I back home, they also followed in a good distance. Then yes, the trafficker, the sailor was caught by my brothers. He admitted that he even took 200 rupees advance in my name and no, don't, don't know for how many nights. And later I came to know that it was very regular there, buying and selling. I was uh, used to be in the hostel since very uh, young age, so I, I, I was not having any, any idea about that, uh, that thing was going on there. So somehow I could say, I mean, I was saved, and that boy who sold me was handed over to the police. Anyway, now by counting the number of incidents or Giving example is not going to bring the solution. We need to urge the government to take serious measures by taking a, uh, making a new law as soon as possible. And we should also engage ourselves in bringing awareness among the people to bring to an end the sexual exploitation. We must unite and raise one single voice against the sexual exploitation of women and girls. Unite means, I mean, even the men folk. The men folk should also work and involve. They should also start organizing programs against the sexual exploitation because it is not only their duties, it is also responsibility. Because no man want prostitute mother, no one man, no, no man want prostitute wife, prostitute daughters or prostitute sisters. So men and women should come together and start working together and raise single voice. This problem is not women's problem. Human trafficking, putting to prostitution, these are not human, uh, women's problem. This is a social problem. At last, whatever it is, 
I would like to say one thing. Women may be neglected, exploited socially, economically, educationally, and sexually still. I would love to say, and I am proud to be a woman. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anjali Daimari, for your powerful presentation and for bringing also the uh, Northeast uh, Bodo Adivasis indigenous groups perspective to our Congress. I think it's extremely key to make those uh, connections as you did. We will now give the floor to Rama Reddy, who is a survival leader from Andhra Pradesh and who is also a member of STOP NGO. Uh, the interpretation will be provided by the chair of STOP NGO, uh, sitting at the, the forefront. So, Rama Reddy, you have the floor. I'll bring your mic. Hi. Uh, namaste. My name is Rama Gundeti. I'm coming from Andhra Pradesh. And I'm living with, I'm working with Stop NGO. And my mother, Roma Deva Prata, she is also here. I'm happy. Um, I'm a little bit nervous because of everyone uh, sharing their uh, life story. So I want to share myself, my story because of, uh, so I mixed Hindi and English because I'm not comfortable in English. So that's why my mommy, uh, she translate in um, English. If you need, then I'll be doing. Otherwise no. You carry on. Because of, uh, I need, uh, I want to uh, share myself. So uh, I don't know <laughs> if I cry, so that's why I, do, I want to uh, translate <laughs> my story. Um, when, I, uh, when I trafficked 2003, so that then uh, I feel, um, so I will uh, speak in Hindi. When I was trafficked, I thought that when I was in the brothel, उस दिन मेरा लाइफ पूरा खत्म हो गया और कोई फ्यूचर नहीं है मेरा और उसी दिन मेरा लाइफ की जो मैंने ड्रीम देखा मेरा जो सिस्टर को हेल्प करना था और माँ पापा के साथ नहीं रह पाई हूँ और यहाँ पे जो लेके आके मुझे छोड़ दिया तो उसे अपना सपना और सब कुछ मैंने देखना बंद कर दिया। I thought that was the end of my life when I first visited the when I was trafficked to the brothel Delhi red light area. My whole dream was shattered, and I felt that that was the end of my life. उसके बाद में फिर मैं कुछ ही दिन के बाद में मुझे स्टॉप ने रेस्क्यू किया है। जब रेस्क्यू किया था बहुत जो जीवी रोड ने मुझे दिखाया जो रास्ता जो उन्होंने मुझे बताया गया कि आपका जिंदगी पूरा जीवी रोड के अंदर ही है और उसके अलावा और कोई लाइफ नहीं है आपकी क्योंकि मुझे चारों तरफ से बंद करके रखा और कोई आपके चारा नहीं है आप बाहर जाओगे तो और किसी को बोलोगे तो आपका लाइफ और यहाँ से लेके और कहीं आपको बेच देंगे फिर आपका लाइफ खत्म हो जाएगा डर के मारे मैं जब रोमा मैम मेरे को रेस्क्यू करने के लिए आई थी तो तब मुझे लगा है कि नहीं ये जाके और कहीं मुझे और अलग जगह बेच देंगे आई वॉज ब्रेन वॉश थरली दैट ऑल ऑफ देम दे सेड द ब्रॉकल ओनर्स एंड अदर पीपल दे सेड दैट इफ समी कम्स इन द नेम ऑफ रेस्क्यूंग यू दे बी सेलिंग यू समेर एल्स so I was scared. I was confined in that area for a longer time. But after three, four months, I was rescued by STOP. And, uh, and we were there. Our STOP team was there. I am very happy that I have been rescued by Roma Mamma. And when I was rescued by the rescue, what were the points that they had? And they had me as a little girl who was a little girl. कहीं लोग जो छोटे बच्चे थे जैसा मैं पंद्रह साल की उम्र में मैं ट्रैफिक हुआ था तो मेरे जैसा कहीं लोग को उन्होंने रेस्क्यू किया है और उनका क्या प्लान करके हमको वहाँ से बाहर निकाल के लेके आया उसके बाद में जो हमने कभी सोचा ही नहीं था कि हमको इस तरीका का जिंदगी मिलेगा uh, so now, now I am happy that we have got a plan in our life. And here I want to add one line that I was uh, outside India somewhere and I was asked that what after rescue? 
I didn't have any answer on that day. But after that day, we really planned each one of the rescued girls, the specific plan for them according to their capacity uh, and their wish. Carry on. जब मैं स्टॉप में एंट्री किया था उसके बाद में मेरे पास कोई चारा नहीं था मैं क्या करूं मैं नहीं रहूंगी यहाँ पे कुछ दिन तक मैंने बहुत रोया भी था तो मम्मी ने मुझे बहुत आ, समझाया था कि आप करना क्या चाहते हो मुझे पता नहीं था कि मैं कहाँ जा रही हूँ क्या था मेरा उस दिन जब मैं लेके आया मेरे साथ में सिर्फ अंधेरा दिखाई दे रहा था जब मैं आने के बाद में मेरे को बहुत स्कूल uh, से जब मैं सातवीं क्लास तक पढ़ी थी तो मुझे कुछ कुछ घर से स्टिचिंग uh, करना आता है और खाना पकाना मुझे बहुत अच्छा लगता है तो कुछ ऐसे चीज़ और मुझे ड्राइविंग इतनी पसंद है कि मैं ड्राइविंग के अलावा और कुछ करना नहीं पसंद करती थी ऐसी कुछ चीज़ें मम्मी ने मेरे से पूछा था उन्होंने कहा है कि तुम क्या बनना चाहते हो तुम डरना नहीं है तुम अपना लाइफ में कुछ बन के दिखाओ जो तुमने इतना रो के सिर्फ फटक फटक के मारती थी कि मैं मुझे नहीं रहना यहाँ पर क्योंकि मेरे साथ जो भी हुआ है वो बहुत बुरा हुआ है और मैं कैसे लोगों को अपना शक्ल दिखाऊंगा कि मैं यहाँ पे जी पाऊंगी या नहीं जी पाऊंगी एज ए एक बोतल से बाहर आने के बाद में हम चार लोग को कैसा देखेंगे हम मुझे कैसे लोग देखेंगे इस तरीका का आई टू फील दैट आई वॉज स्टिगमाटाइज एंड आई कॉन्ट गो टू द मेन स्ट्रीम ऑफ सोसाइटी बिकॉज आई वॉज ट्रैफिक आई वॉज रेप आई वॉज प्रोस्टिट्यूटेड एंड इट वॉज नॉट माई चॉइस एट ऑल बट आई टू क्राई बाई but when i was asked that what exactly i want to do in my life then i uh, expressed that i love cooking i love driving and i love stitching and i had some experience on those uske baad mein fir mera ichha ke anusar ke mummy ne mujhe offers diya hai jo main pasand karti hu jo ha acha theek hai isko ye pasand hai to hum isko ise rasta mein rasta dikhayenge jo aage ja ke apne pair pe khadi hoga और मैं क्या करना चाहती हूँ मेरे इच्छा के अनुसार उन्होंने पूछा है कि फिर मैंने वन डे उनको कहा था कि मैं रेस्क्यू टीम में ज्वाइन करना चाहती हूँ और उसके साथ साथ में मेरे साथ जैसा सर्वेवर्स है विक्टीम है उनको मैं सर्वेवर करना चाहती हूँ और एक स्ट्रॉन्ग वुमेन बना के उनका इंडिपेंडेंट जो खुद अपने पैरों पर पे खड़ा होके वो अपना ज़िंदगी खुद पीछे मुड़ के ना देखे कि मैं भी एक विक्टीम थी एक दिन और मैं आज सर्वेवर हूँ आई वॉन्ट इट to become a strong woman and uh, uh, i was in the rescue team i used to go uh, to the rescue team to rescue other people and i wanted to become a person of uh, dignity and i wanted to become a uh, strong woman now aap sab dekhte hain ki main abhi कहाँ हूँ और मम्मी मेरी स्टोरी ट्रांसलेट कर रही है बट आई एम बहुत खुश हूँ कि मुझे अपने आप ने यहाँ पे बुलाया और उसके साथ में अपना एक्सपीरियंस को शेयर करने के लिए कहा है कि मैं और मेरे जैसे मैं एक रिक्वेस्ट करती हूँ कि जब रेस्क्यू में जाते हैं और रेस्क्यू के साथ में जब लड़की को हम ले आते हैं उनको किस तरीके का काउंसलिंग और उनकी लाइफ उनका एम्बिशन क्या है उनका फ्यूचर और उनको साफ साफ दिखा के और उनका लाइफ आगे बढ़ाने के लिए मदद करें आई वॉन्ट दैट वेन द रेस्क्यू ऑपरेशन इज बिंग डन इट शुड बी राइट बेस्ट एंड लेट दम फील दैट देर दे कैन ऑप्ट फॉर अ बेटर लाइफ एंड आई वॉन्ट टू एड वन थिंग हियर दैट वेन शी केम आर फिजिकल कंडीशन वॉज वेरी बैड एंड इट वॉज लेटर ऑन फाउंड आउट दैट she is a positive child and uh, she was very sick at c dot pro four came down and then from that time onward she became the real strong woman she knows that she is a positive child she doesn't want that anybody else should be in her position so she is very much concerned about that and she counsels the other people those who are not well मैं अभी इतनी हुनर हूँ कि मैं अपने आप को मैं ड्राइविंग कर सकती हूँ एज ए कैब ड्राइवर ड्राइविंग स्कूल में मैं भी टीचर जॉब किया हूँ और अपना अभी मेरा एक ड्रीम था जब मैं आश्रय फैमिली होम में आई थी 2003 में तब मेरे साथ में बहुत सारे मेरे सिस्टर से वो सब डांस अमेरिकन एम्बेसी में एक डांस प्रोग्राम हुआ था उस टाइम हमने एक 
स्टोरी लिखा था तो उसमें हम सबकी इंडिविजुअलिटी पूछा था कि आपका ड्रीम क्या है हमने कहा था कि एक अपना क्योंकि मैं एक्सेसरी में इतनी अच्छी थी स्टिचिंग में तो उसके साथ में मुझे और स्किल सिखाया गया था जूट बैग मेकिंग क्लॉथ्स का और बीट्स वर्क ये सब मुझे सिखाया उसके साथ साथ में ड्राइविंग उसके बाद में कुकिंग बेकिंग एंड बेकरी ट्रेनिंग हमको बहुत दिलाया गया था हम उसके साथ साथ में फिर मैं मेरे टीम को लेके मैं कोशिश कैटरिंग सर्विस अभी मैं कर रही हूँ अभी एक कुछ दस साल पहले एक ड्रीम हमने देखा था वो अभी हमारे लिए एक थाउजेंड ड्रीम बोल के हमने एक अपना इंडिविजुअलिटी एक कैसा बोलते हैं उसको शी इज द हेड ऑफ थाउजेंड ड्रीम्स व्हिच इज अप्रैल बिजनेस व्हिच इज सेंडिंग दे आर सेंडिंग देयर प्रोडक्ट्स टू आउट ऑफ इंडिया शी इज द हेड ऑफ कोशिश कैटरिंग टीम they had 3 years of experience in different university colleges and she is the head person there and she is a very very able uh, driver and she takes me all over because uh, this was also her dream she is a strong woman she is a business uh, woman they have got their own business service and she is uh, she is showing the whole world that hiv positive is no uh, disease and she is a person to uh, show her acumen to the whole world thank you so much ye apna apne mujhe mauka diya mummy thank you apne mujhe for translate yes so you must uh, thank them apne aap and we are really happy uh, to ruchira Uh, and to apnea that you have called my child and i am happy thank you <clears throat> thanks romadi we are honored to so now i'll request soni sori ji uh soni sori is an indigenous tribal activist uh she is adivasi original inhabitant of india and uh, the people here uh, from india knows of her because she has been brutalized by the state militant forces and uh, soni sori ji has uh, right now she uh, is also a member of uh, aam aadmi party and she has fought elections Uh, on behalf of aam aadmi party so now i uh, request soni sori ji to speak soni sori ji ab uh, hum log aap se sunna chahenge aur uh, i will be the translator for soni sori ji as well to main aapka translation bhi karungi aap main मैं छत्तीसगढ़ बस्तर से हूँ अश्वनी सोरी और इस प्रोग्राम में मुझे जो बुलाया और इस तरह से बोलने का मौका दिया जा रहा है जो इतने इतने अलग अलग देशों से जो लोग आए हैं उनके बीच में हमको एक बोलने का एक मौका दिया गया है और वो बस्तर के बारे में आदिवासियों के बारे में अपने बारे में तो इसलिए इस, इसके लिए मैं तय दिल से धन्यवाद कहना चाहती हूँ और धन्यवाद देती हूँ and i am grateful to you all to give me the honor and privilege to come and speak here aur bolne se pehle main aap log se kuch sawal puchna chahti hu before i speak i just want to ask you a couple of questions aur un saathiyon se un deshwasiyon se jo alag alag deshon se yahan aaj ek jut hue hain unse mera ek sawal hai ki main pehla ye ye puchna chahti hu आदिवासी है कौन आदिवासी को इस भारत देश में कोई जगह है या नहीं सो हियर यू आर पीपल कमिंग फ्रॉम ऑल ओवर द वर्ल्ड फ्रॉम डिफरेंट कंट्रीज बिफोर आई स्टार्ट माय स्पीच आई जस्ट वांट टू आस्क यू दैट हु इज आदिवासी हु इज द ओरिजिनल इनहेबिटेंट एंड डू दे हैव एनी राइट इन द नेशन अगर आदिवासियों का कोई अंतर्राष्ट्रीय 
मतलब अंतर्राष्ट्रीय जगह में ऐसा स्थान मिला है तो फिर इन आदिवासियों के साथ इतना आज जो बस्तर में जो हो रहा है जो अभी मैं बताने जा रही हूँ ऐसा क्यों हो रहा है इसलिए मैं यार मेरा ये सवाल है इफ वी द पीपल हियर हैव सम अंडरस्टैंडिंग अबाउट आदिवासी और इंडिजिनस ट्राइब्स ऑल ओवर द वर्ल्ड एंड इंटरनेशनल अंडरस्टैंडिंग आई वॉन्ट टू आस दैट वाई आस द आदिवासी इन इंडिया आर हियर इन द सिचुएशन विच वी आर हियर इन टूडे आज बस्तर के आदिवासी जो छत्तीसगढ़ के जो आदिवासियों से जो मैं जानती हूँ कि एक समाज की एक लड़ाई अलग है लेकिन आज सरकार की एक लड़ाई का दूसरा भाग बन चुका है जो हम सरकार के सरकार ने जो हम पे अत्याचार कर रहे हैं उसके खिलाफ हम जो लड़ रहे हैं कि सरकार ऐसा क्यों कर रही है तो एक समाज की लड़ाई को तो हम ये समझते थे बचपना से हमने देखा था कि समाज किस तरह से एक लड़की का लड़की होना भी एक तरफ से वो तकलीफ थी और एक मतलब बेटी होना पत्नी होना माँ बनना हर चीज़ में एक शोषण समाज वर्ग में होता था लेकिन आज वहाँ ऐसा नहीं आज वहाँ सरकार से हमको इस तरह प्रताड़ना दिया जा रहा है सो वी हैड स्ट्रगल एट लेवल ऑफ आर कम्युनिटी वेर वी आर डिस्क्रिमिनेटेड being born as a girl as, as a woman and beyond that now the biggest uh, the our biggest concern is the state aa wahan ki jo mahilaen hain bastar ki chatisgarh ke adivasiyon ke sath अब आए दिन जो फोर्स है जो हमारी सुरक्षा के लिए सरकार ने हर गांव गांव में लगाए रखा है उस फोर्स के द्वारा उस पुलिस प्रशासन उस पुलिस वाले के द्वारा बलात्कार लगातार होते जा रहा है सो नाउ द इंडियन स्टेट हैज पोस्टेड पुलिस एंड मिलिट्री इन एवरी विलेज ऑफ आवर ट्राइबल होमलैंड एंड एवरी डे द मिलिटर द मिलिट्री एंड द पुलिस दे ब्रूटली रेप और वेमेन एवरी डे वहाँ की जो महिलाओं के साथ जब महिलाएं हैं ये एक गेरुली महिलाएं हैं वहाँ काम करती हैं जंगल जाओ तो उनके साथ पकड़ के बलात्कार होता है खेती करो तो बलात्कार होता है यही नहीं आज छत्तीसगढ़ की जेलों में ऐसे ऐसे महिलाओं को जेल में डाल रखा है जिनके साथ बलात्कार तो करते हैं या करंट छोड़ देते हैं उनके निपलों को काट के जेलों में डाला गया है सो इवन वेन आर वेमेन गोज टू पिच fire out from the forest they are raped when they go to work in the fields they are raped to the extent that now the prisons in chatisgarh is full with the adivasi women and they are subject to torture to the extent not only rape but uh, giving electric shocks and also cutting their nipples aur jo ek ek mahila jo maa banti hai अगर वो हमारी में कल्चर में हमारी मतलब जो हमारे आदिवासी की जगह उस पर यह है कि वो अगर माँ बनती है माँ बनने के बाद वो जब बच्चे को अगर घर में सुला के जाती है घर में सुला के जाएगी और उसको कुछ समय के बाद बच्चे को दूध पिलाने का समय होता है तो उस स्थिति में ये प्रूफ के पुलिस को ये सबूत दिखाने की जरूरत है पुलिस पूछता है तुम माँ बनी हो तो तुम अपने तन से अपना तन को निकालिए और निचोड़ के बताइए कि मैं माँ बनी हूँ अगर वो महिला शर्माती हुई अपने तन को धीरे से पकड़ती है और नोचती वो करती है तो उस स्थिति में पोर्स वाला खुद उस तन से सारा दूध खाली कर देता है उस समय जब बच्चे को जाके वो पिलाने के लिए जाती है माँ तो उस समय वो पिला नहीं पाती बच्चा वहाँ बिलक बिलक के रोते रहता है अंत में वो माँ एक पानी उसके मुंह में पानी डालती है ये पुलिस प्रशासन और वहाँ की सरकार पुलिस जो करती है वहाँ वर्क्स इन द फील्ड तो ड्यूरिंग हर डे टाइम शी गोज बैक एंड फीड्स हर बेबी शी गिव्स ब्रेस्ट मिल्क टू द बेबी सो द पुलिस वेन शी कम्स टू द होम टू फीड हर चाइल्ड द पुलिस आस्क दैट प्रूव दैट यू आर द मदर एंड वेन एंड देन द पुलिस फोर्सिबली ओपन्स हर ब्लाउज टेक्स आउट द नेपल एंड स्क्वीज इज इट एंड मेक्स इट एम टी so when she reaches home the baby doesn't have anything to eat and the mothers just feed water to the baby aur wohi nahi kai mahilaon ke sath jo mahila pet mein hoti hai 
तो वहाँ एक मतलब नक्सल के नाम पे जो ये एक ईशू बनाए हैं अगर उसके पति को अगर महिला बोलती है कि मेरे पति कोई गलती नहीं किया मेरे पति को क्यों लेके आप जा रहे अगर महिला उसका सामना करती हो अगर वो पेट में है और उसमें बंदूक की बट पे मार दिया जाता है जिससे समय से पहले बच्चे को तो जन्म देती है लेकिन माँ नहीं बचती वो मर जाती है और वो बच्चा आज भी जिंदा है तो ये एक बंदूक की बट पे मारने के बाद समय से पहले बच्चा पैदा होता है ये भी एक तरफ का प्रताड़ना होता है वहाँ सो विथ आस द आदिवासी दे से दैट इन द नेम ऑफ कार्विंग नक्सलाइट टेररिज्म दे जस्ट किल द मादर द प्रेगनेंट मादर एंड दे शव दे हिट द वोम द प्रेगनेंट mother's womb with the butt of the gun and the mother gives birth sometimes but she dies to wahan wahan hota kya hai jab force jati hai gaon mein jaane ke baad 3 din 4 din gaon ko ghear ke rakhti hai to purush bag jate hain jangal mein apni jaan bachane ke liye kyunki unko seedha atya kar diya jata hai har mahilaen jab ghar mein rehti hain to mahilaon ko 4 din police force agar wahan hai तो रोज आना उनके साथ बलात्कार होता है कि रोज का ये सहते हैं और रोज उसको ये बलात्कार करते हैं और उसके दौरान अगर उसको कोई रोकता है उसकी सांस रोकती है तो उसको इतनी बुरी तरह मारा जाता है उसको सामूहिक बलात्कार करके ये बोला जाता है उसकी सास को तेरे बेटे में दम नहीं थी इसको बच्चा पैदा करने का हमने अब बच्चा अब बच्चा पैदा होगा क्योंकि हमने इनको दम पैदा कर दिया तो बलात्कार सामूहिक बलात्कार होने के बाद ये बोला जाता है कि तुम्हारे बेटे में दम नहीं थी बच्चा पैदा करने के अब वो तुम्हारी बहू मां बनने वाली है और वो बेहोश पड़े रहती है सो शी शी सेड दैट द पुलिस कॉर्डन ऑफ द विलेजेस फॉर डेज आफ्टर डेज वीक्स आफ्टर वीक्स एंड द मेन फ्ली टू द जंगल एंड व्हेन एंड द पुलिस कम्स द मिलिट्री कम एंड गैंग रेप द वुमेन and beat up the old women and they say that so see uh, your men do not have the uh, do, do not have the uh, enough capacity to uh, give to you know impregnate her so now she will be impregnated by the uh, by the state ye to wah aaye din hai ki rozana अगर कोई लड़कियां जैसे जवान जवान लड़की रहती है 16-17 साल तो वो सोचती हैं कि मतलब हम शादीशुदा हैं तो बच जाएंगे और कई महिलाएं शादीशुदा रहती हैं उनको ये बोला जाता है कि अगर तुमने शादी किया तुम्हारे पति हैं तो तुम्हारा अंग छोटा क्यों है उसके कपड़े खोले जाते हैं और उसको निवस्त्र किया जाता है उससे ये पूछा जाता है ये तुम्हारा अंग क्यों छोटा है ये बड़ा क्यों नहीं है क्योंकि तुम जूड़ बोल रही हो तुम्हारी कोई शादी नहीं तो वो उसके अंगों को फिर पकड़ के उसको नोचते हैं खींचते हैं तो बोलते हैं आठ दिन बाद तुम्हारा बड़ा हो जाए ऐसे वहाँ महिलाओं के साथ पुलिस प्रशासन करती है ये सारे महिलाएं वहाँ जेलती हैं और रोजाना अभी भी कोई बंद नहीं हुआ वो रोज का ये हाल है वहाँ सो एवरी डे द पुलिस कम्स एंड एंड समाइम्स दे थिंक दैट ओके इफ द वुमेन इज मैरिड शी विल बी सेव फ्रॉम बींग रेप बट द मिलिटरी कम्स opens her clothes and sees the size of her genitalia and and ask that why are they so small and the whole day they gang rape her and they say now we have made it big तो ये तो मैंने वहाँ की बस्तर की महिलाओं से छत्तीसगढ़ की महिलाओं की कहानी तो बहुत सारे समय कम है तो मैं अपनी कहानी बताती हूँ कि ये किस तरह से पुलिस प्रशासन कैसे और करती है ये जो रूबारू जो मैं अपनी जो हकीकत है मेरी जो कहानी है मेरी जो दास्तान है वो आपके सामने मैं रख के उस बात को स्पष्ट करती हूँ कि कैसे करती है मैं एक टीचर थी सो दिस इज वॉट हैपन्स टू आस द वेमेन ऑफ बास्तर द इंडिजिनस वेमेन ऑफ बस्तर every day now i'll just uh, to conclude i'll tell you about my story i was a teacher school teacher mai ek sadharan teacher thi jo bahut hi ek shiksha bachcho ko padhana mera kartavya tha aur mai sirf bachcho ko padhati thi aur meri atyachar ne aap matlab aap sabke samne itna bada baat rakhne ka ek sahas diya meri atyachar ne mujhe ladna sikhaya मेरी अत्याचार ने उन आदिवासियों को लिए लड़ना सिखाया उन आदिवासियों के लिए जीना सिखाया आई वॉज जस्ट 
merely a school teacher and used to teach the little kids in the school. But what has happened to me, the torture, this torture that has happened to me has taught me to speak not only for myself, but on behalf of my community, on behalf of my tribe. And when the police made me so many cases of cases, I was arrested. After being arrested, I was kept in the tane. I mean, when I was arrested, I was given two days to two days. I was kept in the two days, I was kept in the tane. I was kept in the Quran. And I was kept in the Nivastra. So I was uh, falsely implicated in a case. I have been taken to the police station before being taken to the court. And in the police station for two days, I have been stripped of my uh, clothes and electrocuted.